Welcome back, MTG Joe here. Today, we're gonna to be doing our first installment of the weekly meta breakdown for the new Ixalan standard best of one meta. Uh, we did a first day look, more so to just look at some stuff that wasn't performing well, but we've got in a few days, almost a week's worth of data. So we're gonna start looking at what decks are performing well. Now note, this is three year rotation standard. So in most cases, we're not gonna see completely net new decks. But usually innovations or kind of tweaks on existing archetypes, stuff like that, better cards coming in. Um, so as always, we get the data from Untapped GG, a companion tool that runs alongside Arena's client, tracks your win rates, aggregates it with other users, gives a whole bunch of cool stats, deck collections, in-game overlays, a whole bunch of cool stuff. Link is in the video description if you want to get started with Untapped. Uh, this will be for standard best of one. We'll do best of three in the next day or so. Uh, once we get all the data up, we also have some MTGO League data as well. And then we'll take a look later in the week at Historic and Explore as well. Get you kind of a snapshot in terms of what's working for those formats as well. Usually it takes seven days for the meta to unlock uh, the data sets for those eternal formats. So we're going to get started. Platinum to Mythic rank, popularity of the day. So again, popularity doesn't mean necessarily win rate. It's just what you're most likely to encounter on the ladder. And with the first week, it's usually a lot of people playing the, the decks they have with maybe a new card here or there, in part because they're accumulating their collection. Not everyone's going to drop hundreds of dollars on the set. Some are free to play, some do the draft first. So all kind of factors to consider when you, we look at the first week of data. But Mono Red continues to be the most popular deck, 21%. Mono White Humans at 12, Golgari Midrange at 7, uh, Enchantments 5.5. And we have a couple control decks, Azorius Control is just more traditional control. Four color controls, the Domain decks. And then mono blue tempo, which is more of a budget deck, and then mono black aggro. Uh, the mono black aggro could be likely at times grouped in with those like mid range kind of shielded piles. We're just looking at like trends. Been pretty static. We've seen an uptick in mono white uh, with the last like little week, upwards of you know peaking five percent higher than it was in, in previous weeks. Uh, as well as Golgari, that's seen a bit of an an increase. Actually, the Golgari decks decreased. Sorry. Uh, it was like in the 8s, 9s, and now it's down to like 6 7%. Um, so everything's kind of flat right now. Usually once we have like a big event, we'll see more dramatic shifts. But we are starting to see some new archetypes and at least some new cards getting played in the decks themselves. So just quickly looking, we have 150,000 matches we're going to look at today, November 14th through the 19th. So five days worth of data. Platinum to Mythic rank. And we're going to jump right into it. I'll timestamp and put all the deck lists in the video description so you can get follow along from there um, and then as always if you can drop a like comment and subscribe on the video but jumping in mono white human 70.3% 110 matches and two new cards in this deck we have warden of the inner sky so this is a, another one drop human soldier so this can actually fit both archetypes if you're interested uh, both the soldiers deck and the humans deck so it has incidental value there it has three or more counters on it it gets flying and vigilance and you can tap uh, three untapped artifacts and or creatures you control to put a counter on it and scry. Notably, this is only at sorcery speed, so you can't do it at opponent's end step. But this can give you like a late game kind of value. Over the top flying it usually helps in these kind of creature mirrors. Uh, you can put counters on things. Actually, you can't in this particular list. In the Pioneer versions, you have Thalia's Lieutenant, but a uh, cheap one drop that can get bigger over time, but you do create tokens with things like Adelin as well as Sanguine Evangelist. So three mana, two, one, enters the battlefield, you create a bat. When it dies, you create a bat. And then it has a, an older keyword called Battle Cry. So when the Evangelist attacks, you, your other attacking creatures get plus one power to end the turn. So just a boost. So even with like Adeline's tokens, it's another kind of Anthem effect. You play that with the Copper Coat Vanguards or the Adversaries and it makes your creatures quite large. Night Air and Vios for card advantage, Brutal Cathar's removal, and kind of the package that we see with humans. So only removal of the deck's Brutal Cathar, but otherwise this deck's trying to kill your opponent, not necessarily interact. Uh, copies of Maestro's Foundry, and then I guess a Ganjo's removal as well. We then move to Esper Control, 65% uh, win rate, and nothing too much in terms of new cards beyond Get Lost, a uh, new one mana. Removal spell, flexible that it hits creatures, enchantments, and planeswalkers, giving map tokens as opposed to Fateful Absence, which gives a clue token. Sunset Revelry is really good against all the aggressive decks. Elspeth Smite kind of mixed into there. Another card we haven't seen too much play, Legion to Ashes. 
XL target an online permanent an opponent controls and all tokens that player controls with the same name. So against the go wide decks, it has some utility. Uh, the end's an interesting one, a little bit pricey for best of one, I think. Like if you're paying four mana to kill a one drop, not the best, but uh, I would probably just play some more cheaper removal, cut down, stuff like that. Uh, Kaya's and Eternal Wanders, Sunfall Tokens, Wandering Emperor, all win cons. This version of the deck's also playing the new creature land, Restless Reef. Uh, gives you a 4-4 uh, Blue Shark and could cause some mill. Uh, you can also technically win with the Virtue of Persistence as the creature side, or sorry, the enchantment side to reanimate your opponents. No Myrex in the mana base in this. You are playing multicolors, so uh, kind of playing into the need. It's also playing three field of in a multicolor deck, which is kind of interesting. Mono Red. Again, Mono Red was the most popular deck. Still reasonable win rate at 64%. Uh, this version of the deck, um, slightly different. So we see fewer squeeze. We're seeing three main deck Urbras Forge in best of one. Against heavy removal, this lets you kind of get some more value, getting a creature every turn. In best of three, this is a card I play in the sideboard. And it's like the Golgari decks, kind of the more controlling decks. Uh, just to give you recurring value. Versions on a lot more one drops with Voldaire and Epiture, the full play set of Monstrous Rage. This number kind of varies, similar with Phoenix Chick, single copy of Felden, um, and then only two copies of Bloodthirsty Adversary. So trimming a little bit of the two drop package for more one drops. Uh, the one thing I would say normally, like in best of three, I only play one Felden. In best of one, I would probably play two. We see a lot of the decks being creature based decks. So it's better into like the creature mirrors that, that are especially like the non-black ones to have removal. 20 lands, a um, little low, I would say. Uh, these basic mountains are amazing. Uh, I want to get them for my deck in paper, but um, you are a little bit light, but you are trimming a little to the one drop. I would probably feel more comfortable 22, but uh, it is putting up results at 64%. We then go to Esper Legends, another deck that every set just finds a new legend to throw into the pile of good rares and mythics. And at 63%, the card for the, the set is Kellen Daring Traveler. So uh, you aren't really going to be casting the journey on ability through the adventure, which creates map tokens. You're casting this as a 2-mana two 2-3. Two, and then when it attacks, you reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature with mana value 3 or less, you put it in your hand. Otherwise... You may put it in your graveyard. Uh, so this hits like pretty much all your creatures. So it's card advantage, which plays particularly well with Rafine, since you can then discard those extra copies, anything like that, provide some utility. Um, it looks like they have trimmed on the Denix in lieu of that. I do like Denix in best of one just from a lifelink body. The curve of like Denix into Rafine can stonewall a lot of these aggressive decks. I would probably cut the one of make this appear in the best of one format, just it's more of like an open deck list consideration that we saw from Worlds, but having a single make this appear is not going to be the best. Uh, I would either play like another Denic or the full play set or go for the throats in lieu of it. I'm not going to go like too much into detail. This deck's been like the same deck since like three years now, it feels. We then go to the first dinosaur deck. So we're going to have two concurrent dinosaur decks. There's kind of this Naya version of the deck. So 59.8, we'll say 60%. So it's a fight rigging deck uh, along with hulking rap. This one's going a little bit larger on the curve. So you have just really your only early drops are Ixali's Lore Keeper and Paleontologist, both of which can um, ramp you ahead. Cool thing with Untapped, you can see like I don't own a lot of the cards for this string or this dinosaur deck. Um, it'll give you like a wild card sync, tell you how many cards you need. So if you're looking to build decks, it's another useful tool. Um, but basically, fight rigging with Tenacious Hammer Skull lets you cheat into play any of your bigger ones. Hulking Raptor lets you go turn four. Like, if you curve out normally, it's turn five, play a big thing. But if you have any of these drops, you can turn four. The Dracosaur is card advantage, um, as well as tokens. Then you have, this is my favorite card of the set, opening Carnosaur. So many combos in uh, Explore and Historic with it. This Cascade is, turns out Discover, even though it's fixed, is still broken when you get to cast free spells. So it's a 6 mana, 7-6 seven, trample that then finds you another card for free and then in a pinch can be removal. But you're either going Trumpeting Carnosaur, Itali, and then you can even like Itali into Trumpeting Carnosaur that then can find you a Boneyard Dracosaur, so like Value Town. There's also Gashat's Sun's Avatar that could come into play. A little bit tighter on the mana, obviously, with the Hulking Raptor since it only makes double green, but 
and you have to hit the white, but still a pretty big, powerful top end that lets you then cheat and play more dinosaurs. And then you have Skullport Nexus, which is kind of bad uh, Great Henge. When creatures die, you get like other tokens from it, and you can double target creatures' power, uh, which with a number of tramplers could be a good game there as well. So like Atali's or Trumpeting Carnosaurs, anything of the likes. Uh, mana base, we have full Cavern of Souls, which helps, as well as the new um, Restless Ridgeline. The one thing here, don't play Rugged Highlands. This looks like a budget consideration. Just play the full Copper Line. Like, this shouldn't be here. It looks like they ran out of wild cards. Um, there's better lands. Like, even playing just... If you want more of the duels, like, play more Restless Ridgeline over it. But this should be Copper Line Gorge uh, in place of that. Um, so, yeah. Keep that in mind. Then there's the Gruel Dinosaur deck at 58.5. So, this is a um, smaller version of the deck. Uh, still some top end, but we see like the Triumphant Chomp is more interaction early, Belligerent Yearling as another like smaller uh, creature, 3-2 Trample that gets bigger when you cast other creatures. Uh, just two Paleontologists, It's Skinneth versus of Born of Gishath, the uh, creature removal. Comes in, pays two extra mana, and then you can have a dinosaur you control fight another creature. Or, sorry, actually deals damage, which is better than fight. Um, because you don't have to worry about things like Shieldry's Death Touch, for example. A card that seems a little out of place here is the Poison Dart Frog. Uh, I guess it's just being played for mana, but again, this seems like it's because they ran out of wild cards for the Paleontologist. So again, I would just play the full four Paleontologists in place of the Intrepid. Uh, sorry, in, in the, uh, the slot of the Dart Frog. So I'll make that adjustment to the deck list if you do want to ingest it in. Uh, and kind of go from there. But you have your Hammer Skulls, Trunkle Phobax, a Dinosaur, the Hulking Raptors, Rampaging Ferocidons, and then similar top end. This one's on Kogla and Yandara. So a little bit more early game and then a little less late game, big kind of value plays. The Domain deck, I'm going to mention it because it's still putting up results. 58.3%. Uh, Nothing's really changed with this deck. The only thing that I've seen some lists are they're playing Cavern of Souls as a one or two of. Uh, that allows your Traxa by naming angels. Both Archangel of Wrath and Atraxa are both angels. It makes them uncounterable. That's something you may want to consider. There's probably less counter-based magic in best of one, so having cleaner mana is probably beneficial. In best of three, I would entertain the Cavern of Souls, just because most of the decks that are playing blue will shift to a counterspell of like Stainful Stroke variety in the sideboard for these big mana wrap decks. Then go to Gruel Agro, so this is kind of the Sly, like it's, like Sly Red is the name. Uh, Tom Ross popularized it before, but very low to the ground aggro deck with a bunch, bunch of pump spells. This one's at 58%. Uh, so Monastery Swiss Spear, Cophony Scamp, Picnic Ruiner, Busting Druid, and you have a Maya Iconicus. And then you have like Ancestral Anger gives a bonus of power, and Trample draws you a card. Audacity gives a plus. Of power gives trample giant growth just for like surprise damage uh mirin blade splicer flash give plus two oh monstrous rage there's just lots of ways to pump your team trying to kill your opponent that bit there uh, very quickly along those lines um so this one's called esper legends but it's really esper flash at 56 percent so we have um a bunch of different flash creatures so with our commando very mastermind uh, we have the Spectral Adversary, Errant, and Giada, kind of the engine of the deck. Flash Fly 2-3, uh, and then you can cast spells from the top of your library with either Flash or Flying. So it lets you like instant speed flash in a Rafine from the top of your library, which is kind of sweet. Werewolf, Bodyguard, Protection, like either you can protect your creature or get rid of one of your opponents. Earth ties off the top. Uh, you can actually flash an Invasion of uh, Innistrad as some removal. Obscura Interceptor lets you kind of tempo your opponent out, gives you a life linker, Wandering Emperor, and then you have like Fading Hope, Soul Partitions, kind of mixed into there as well. So interesting kind of take on the tempo-oriented deck list there. You then go to Selesnia Life Gain Angels deck. This was like the auto AI generated name of the deck. What does this deck do? Selesnia Life Gain Angels deck. 55%. Um, so not as good as like we have because we don't have Bishop of Wings, we don't have um, Righteous Valkyrie, but trying to do its best. We got the reprint of Resplendent Angel. Uh, 
I think I like this art better. Let me know what you think. Like, I think the promo art, like the box or collector's booster box art is the best one, but I like the colors on this one better. Uh, Luminarch Veterans gain you life. Giada makes you bigger angels. Trepid Adversary can gain you life. Voice of the Blessed gets bigger when you gain life. Uh, Augur of Autumn lets you play cards at the top of your library, including lions. And then if you have Coven, you can play creatures. Sigarda Font of Blessings give your other creatures hexproof. And then you may cast the angels and humans off the top of your library. So some more card advantage off the top. Night Air and Eos lets you get some card advantage. And Steel Seraph's another way to enable lifelink. So you're not getting like huge amounts of life from just the ETB. It's mostly through like lifelink based abilities. Um, through the Steel Seraph, through the Intrepid Adversary to kind of push through that life game needed for the deck. You then go to Is It Pirates, and I'm, I'm not going to lie, I haven't drafted Pirates yet. I don't know what most of these Pirates do, so we're going to take a learning time together. I know what Breaches does at least, but 55% uh, win right here. Uh, we have Goblin Tomb Raider, which is 2-2 uh, two -two with haste if you control an artifact. The Spyglass Siren makes a map token and is a flyer. Kumano's Voltage Surge, Captain Storm, Co Cosmium Raider. Uh, this one here, whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, put a 1 1 counter on target pirate you control. So your map tokens, your treasure tokens, anything like that gets your other pirates a little bit larger. Staunch Crewmate can find you artifacts or pirates, so sign it kind of like a card advantage. The Subterranean Schooner has been really good. So this lets you, it's a very cheap crew, so two mana, three, four, cruise for only one, so pretty much every creature crews it, and then whenever you crew, uh, that creature explores, that crewed it. So kind of some value there, where you can get multiple explorers, um, kind of valued in that. And then, so it's only when it attacks, though. You could technically crew it multiple times, I believe, and then with a single attack, but uh, gives you some value, gives you some card advantage into there. Breaches got a lot of utility here, so it's a three mana three three. When it attacks, uh, whenever a pirate you control attacks, uh, you either create a treasure token, which can enable like the Stokosium, whatever it is. Uh, it could give you fodder to voltage surge, but does that target creature can't block, or you exile the top card of your library to play it for the turn. There's also cards, a kite sail larcenist, so three mana three two, a uh, two three, sorry, flying ward one. And there's a battlefield for each opponent. You get to target an artifact creature they control, and basically, as long as the kite sails on the field, that permanence becomes a treasure token. So it's kind of like a brutal Cathar style effect in blue, which soccer frenzies in there. You got some caverns and secluded courtyard to fix the mana. And then lastly, mono green ramp. Uh, interesting, not playing the two mana find a forest, uh, but you have Sinote Scout as a way to explore. Uh, Wake in the Woods is a big mana. Azusa, Deep Finder to kind of put some lands to play. It's kind of like a mono green stompy ramp deck. Um, interesting, only 24 lands with a curve this high. Uh, but Pelucranos, Topiary Stomper can find you some lands. Tribute to the World Tree lets you get some card draw or counters. Invoke the Ancients for tokens. Got Gruff Triplets. Just kind of like big chunky green cards mixed into there. Um, I will just say, I'm not going to highlight the deck list, but the Ancient Grixis one... Grixis Ancient 1 deck's not doing too hot. Still like 30% win rate for the version that's being tracked. Also the Cage decks, while well, interesting, uh, they're like 29 to 38% for the versions that I've seen. So something just to kind of consider. That's it for the week. Let me know what you think, what you've been playing, what you've been enjoying. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching.